Are you a real estate agent looking to master your listing presentation while well, you are watching the right video? Listing Master, right here, about to help you out the best way I can. You ready? Let's go. Hey, what's up? It's Chris Martin, real estate agent, investor, coach. If you have not already, please subscribe to this channel. I would personally appreciate that very much. Now, I have built my business off of listings. Majority of my sales, I'm talking 95% of my sales in the first five years of my career in real estate have been all listings. And by the way, I've been doing this for 15 years. So I've been going on listing appointment after listing appointment after listing appointment. So we're about to get into real strategies on how I prepare and how I conduct my listing appointments to help me have a better chance at getting that signature when I'm out at that appointment. So we're about to get into it right now. Welcome, we're gonna be talking today about listing presentations and getting you guys geared up, especially if you have a listing presentation coming up. We wanna make sure that you actually can get that signature. Walk away from that house with that signature. And I'm a firm believer of a one-step close. I personally don't believe in two-step closes going out, meeting with a seller, leaving, coming back, having them think through things. From my experience, I've learned really quickly that your best chance at getting the signature is at the first meeting. When you leave, time kills all deals. So you need to write that down, keep it in front of you, because that's the truth. Time is going to kill all deals and you're at risk of losing a listing if you're not getting that signature when you go out in that first meeting. So today I wanna to help you guys prepare to get that signature when you're going out in that first meeting. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Let me pull up some slides here for you so I can have something to reference. First, I want to go over why listings. Listings are the name of the game in real estate because business comes to you. You wanna have that inventory. You wanna have the inventory where you become, you become the store, right? Business comes to you. And it's easier to scale if you have listings in real estate. If you're working with 10 buyers that are all looking at property, they're all putting in offers, they're all doing the things that they do as buyers, not to say that can't be done, it's just going to be a lot harder to actually execute that. Whereas if you have 10 listings, you can manage 10 listings a lot easier than you can manage 10 active buyers. So a lot easier to scale with listings. You can control your commission. So as a buyer agent, you can't control your commission. You get what you get and you don't get upset. I say that to my kids all the time and that's what you have to abide by if you are a buyer agent. You get what you get and you don't get upset. Whatever's listed on MLS, that's what you get. As a listing agent, you get to control your commission. You get to go out there and directly negotiate with the seller and have your commission be dictated by you when you're meeting with that seller. So a lot of agents are looking to get four, five, 6%. Four is gonna be on the low side. Five, a lot of agents are trying to get in 6%. You know, Some agents are getting depending on the area and depending on how much negotiating skills that you have as an agent. And when you get the 6%, you don't necessarily have to do a 50-50 split. Some agents do, and they give three out to the buyer's agent, they keep three. A lot of times you'll see people offer out two and they keep four. It's totally up to you as a listing agent and how you conduct your business. Branding. So branding's another thing that you get to really benefit from with a listing. When you have a listing, you can have your branding on it. You get the sign in front of the yard, yes, but you get the online exposure. You get to add this to your portfolio of listings and attract more sellers that are looking to sell their property. So these are things that to me make it a, a sure thing why you guys should be going after listings. You need to visualize getting the listing. Practice your presentation. You need to role play. You need to role play your canned presentation with someone to be able to be, to make some adjustments. You have to be open to feedback, okay? Because there's, once we internalize our presentation, yes, we have it and we can deliver it. How are we delivering it? Because the next level stuff is all gonna be on delivery. How are we delivering what we know. And, and I can tell you from person to person, the information pretty much remains the same for the most part, but the way you deliver it, that stuff can change, right? How's your tone, right? How's your inflection? All that stuff changes from seller to seller. 
So be open to feedback. If you are getting feedback, make sure you're getting it from another agent that is active on the listing so they know what to expect. They know what things should sound like. And they're asking you the right questions. They're giving you the right objections. On a role play, you don't want someone just to yes, 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 all the way through that interaction. You want them to give you at least two objections, an objection, something standing in a way from you getting that appointment or you getting that signature. That's what you want someone to throw at you because you're going to have to come up with these objection handlers and you want them to also be canned and ready to go. That way, when someone gives you something that stands in the way of you getting a signature, internally, you're almost like, oh, I couldn't wait for you to say that. I'm glad you mentioned that because here's what I have to say. And you go into that explanation. So it really shouldn't be a battle and a, and a conflict. It should almost be like, <laughs> let's go. And you can't wait for someone to say the things they're saying because you're prepared. You're prepared and ready to close and go through those conversations. So record yourself is another thing you guys can do. Recording yourself so you can see what you sound like, hear what you sound like, and make those adjustments on your own. Master the hot topics. So the hot topics, there's going to be three of them that you are going to have to basically face on every single appointment. So you might as well get ready for them. There's three things you're going to have to face on every single appointment. You might as well get ready for them. If I say it twice, you know it's important, right? Yeah, commission. I hear commission. Commission is definitely going to be something that you have to prepare yourself for on a listing appointment. So you better be well-versed inside and out on how you're going to handle that commission. Someone's going to tell you, hey, Chris, maybe you're going in there, you're looking for a 5% commission. Someone's going to tell you, hey, Chris, can you do it for four? My uncle Charlie said he'll do it for three. I got someone I know will do it for two. Redfin said they do it for one. They're going to be saying all these ridiculous things. You have to be prepared and ready to handle that conversation in an articulate way. You can't just, just wing, wing your way through it and say, oh, I'm just going to say whatever comes to mind. No, you have to already have what you need to say canned and ready in your toolbox okay not a physical toolbox that you bring with you but a mental toolbox that's in your head that you have all of these handlers these conversation pieces that you can pull out of that toolbox depending on what someone says so commission yes number one we got to protect our price so one of the things that i love and i'll give you a quick objection handler but there's a bunch of other videos that are purely on objection handlers solely so i would watch those videos so we're not going to go over too much objections but here's one of them chris will you cut your price you know i hear what you're saying mr or mrs seller you, you it's to me it sounds like you're looking to save the most amount of money as possible or net the most amount of money as possible am i right yeah we are great i totally understand that i respect that what would that say about me as a person if right out of the gate i'm willing to cut my commission i'm willing to just chop it down. I'm bringing my commission to the table. I charge 5%. That's what I charge. What would it say to me and my negotiating skills if I just cut it right down to four based off of what you're telling me? For the agents that do that, I would think about that. Because if they're not willing to protect their own money, what's going to happen when they're negotiating your dollar? I stand behind my commission. And I can tell you what I can promise you is I'm going to stand behind your dollar when we're out there on the market negotiating. How does that sound? Let's go to work for you. I would much rather have someone who stands behind a dollar and can negotiate like that. Think about this in a real estate transaction. And the objection handler is over. I'm just talking to you now. Think about this in a real estate transaction. If they're looking to save 1% on a $500,000 listing, what is that? What's that equate to number wise? 500,000. Yes. 1,500. 1,500. Five grand. All right. They're looking to save five grand. For a good negotiator, for a good negotiator, a good real estate agent, is $5,000 a lot to make up in a negotiation? No, real estate happens in big chunks, 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 chunks. 1% is peanuts compared to what actually can be made in a real estate transaction. And I'll go back into my objection handler. And by the way, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I want you to take a look at the properties that I've sold recently, what I listed them for and what I actually sold them for. This property, $100,000 over asking, $40,000 over asking, $65,000 over asking. What position do you want to be in? Let's look at the bottom line here. 
So something to think about on the commission. The other two things that I'm going to talk about when we're talking about hot topics and the top three things to master during a listing presentation, one of them is going to be commission. The other one's going to be your marketing strategy, what you actually do to sell the property, what differs from you compared to another agent. That's pretty much it, right? We could have this elaborate marketing strategy and all these things that we do. What makes you different? Because if they're interviewing more than one person, everyone's going to have a 30, 50 point marketing strategy. What makes you different? So what I would focus on, if I was you when going out to a listing presentation, yes, you want to know, maybe you do have a 30 point marketing strategy. However, what are the one, two or three points that make you different? Because that's what you're going to focus on. If I'm sitting with someone and I know that they, they, they hit some key words for me, like, oh, online, exposure, um, social media. If I hear them sort of talk about these things, I'm definitely going to focus in on some of the social media stuff that I do. Maybe coming soon. Maybe it's my reach to, uh, on YouTube. Maybe it's my reach on Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is. I want to focus on these hot points that can resonate with the person that's across from me. And there shouldn't be that many of them, right? Because you're going to have to, you don't want to go through a whole 30 point marketing strategy. By the time you get to the number 30, they're going to be sleeping, right? You want to be able to hit the, yes, you can skim through them, but you want to be able to hit on the one or two that's really going to resonate with them. So which one, two or three are going to be teed up, ready to go that you can, uh, that you can deliver. So commission, marketing strategy, these are two very important things that you need to make sure that you are perfecting. The other one is going to be price because you know there's going to be an issue, right, with someone thinking what their property should sell for and it actually being listed at. A lot of people, you know, and again, this is not a battle. This is just reality. Most people who own a home think their home is worth more than it is. That's just the reality, right? Their home should be listed at 500. They think it's worth 600,000. So I'm not going to go too much in on the pricing of it. But again, we have videos right here on this channel that if you're interested in how to price property, then you, would sh you should watch that video so you can learn how to price property and learn how to deliver that message once you do price property. So, but pricing property, this is something that is undoubtedly going to come up. Commission, marketing strategy, and pricing property. How well are you prepared to deliver that message of pricing property? So on a listing presentation, you should have that teed up and ready to go. So we want to set yourself up to the close. So before we even go out, and we'll kind of walk through what the in-person looks like when you do go out to meet with that person, all this stuff is pre-appointment that we've been talking about so far. So pre-appointment, excuse me, we want to set yourself up for the close. So when you're scheduling the appointment, whether it's on the phone or in person, however you're scheduling the appointment with this person, let's just assume it's on the phone, you want to set yourself up for the close. So one of the most annoying things in real estate for me is calling someone and then calling them back and you can't get them back on the phone. How many times has that happened to you? You call someone and you cannot get them back on the phone. We have to understand this as real estate agents. Just because we're talking to someone doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to talk to them again. They could ghost us, right? And it happens all the time. So we have to prepare ourselves for that. And not to say that this will cure this problem 100%, but it'll better our odds. So how do we do that? Best number and time to call you. Hey, uh, you know, I'm glad we got we got this all set up. What, what's your work schedule like? Let's find out what their day to day looks like, because if they're working every single day and they get out at the same hour, they're driving home from work at the same time, they're picking up the kids at the same time. We need to find out those little pockets of time that they would be available for a phone call. That way, if we do need to hit them back, we can schedule accordingly on our side to say, hey, no, you know what, I'm going to call them between three and four, because I know that they're picking up their kids at four and they're on their way to pick up their kids at three. They're in the car. They have some commuting time, more likely to answer the phone. That's just a scenario. Best time frame to call you. That's number to call you on. It is the best number. What's your preferred means of communication? 
Some people don't like phone calls. Some people prefer text message. Some, some people prefer instant messenger, whatever. What's their best communication and how they want to communicate? Let's ask these things on the phone while we have them because it may be we never have them again. So <laughs> hold them tight and make sure you don't let go. Anyone else, anyone else helping you on making a decision? If there's someone else helping them make a decision on this, we want to see if they can actually be there with them. Now, I actually don't even like anyone else there with them, to be honest with you. If it's up to me, I'd rather just deal with one person. The reality is if there's someone else helping them make a decision, we might as well bring them on in because they're going to be chap, chap, chapping in the ear uh, along the way. So we might as well bring them in so we can deliver the information with them uh, at the table since they're going to be in their ear anyway. We might as well be have it welcome them in the conversation. Even if they're not an actual decision maker, they may be helping to make a decision. Someone's niece, nephew, brother, dad, parent, whatever. Asking them why did they buy the house they're in now? So why did they originally buy the house when they bought it? This is going to help you sort of come to the table and really pull on those heartstrings once you're in person with them. Why they bought the house. And by the way, why they bought the house very well could be reasons why other people bought the house, will buy the house as well. So you can add that in to your marketing pitch uh, when you actually end up marketing the property. Finding out when they want to sell. In an ideal time frame, when would you want to sell this house? Some people don't understand the time that it takes to list and sell a property. Some people may think it takes three months. Some people may think it takes two weeks. People don't know. So understanding when they want to be out can help you game plan when to list the property. And it can give you an idea on how urgent things need to be handled. So where they want to go when they do sell. This is all going to tie into the motivation, which is the most important piece of information when gathering information about uh, this person on the reason why they're selling their house, because that's going to be something that we need to revisit from time and time, uh, from time to time, because it's their motivation on selling. Do they have enough motivation to sell their house? Some people say they want to sell their house, but you know, what, how many times have we heard this? If we sell, we sell. If we don't, we don't. You know, whatever. If we sell, we sell. We don't, we don't. Well, why are you looking to sell in the first place? Well, we want to go down here. We have to find out what that motivation is like, because if that person who says, if we sell, we sell, we don't, we don't. If they really feel that way, that deal, is it more likely to stick together when things get tough or fall apart when things get tough? It's more likely to fall apart when things get tough. If they really, yeah, if we sell, we sell. If we don't, we don't. How is that going to stick together versus someone who says, you know what, my only child, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a grandparent for the first time. And I need to be around my grandchild. My, and my daughter lives in Kentucky. I need to get, I, I really, I'm retired. I want to get down. There. I have no other family. That's important motivation, right? Because they, you know, what happens if they don't sell? Now they're going to have to commute. They're going to have, they're going to be a distance away. So it's always why they want to sell, where they want to go, the reason for going there, and what happens if they don't go. Some people don't want to put up with another winter. What happens if they do put up with another winter? Do you really want to go out there and sh shovel again? I know we had a light winter last winter, but something tells me this winter is not going to be so good, right? You're going to have to dust off that snowblower this time. So all these things have to be talked about. We cannot just go and list a property and put it on the market without getting some background. It's going to do a couple of things. It's going to help us get through a transaction, but it's also going to tie us in with the seller that we're selling the property for, right? How much more powerful can a conversation be when they're on the edge or on the verge of accepting an offer and not accepting an offer? If we can say, you know what? This is the only offer that we got on the table. Usually, from my experience, the best offer is the first offer. Let's just... Get this out of the way. I know it's not exactly what you wanted. Let's sign the offer. Take what we have on the table. Get you over to Kentucky so you can spend some time with your grandchild. Not have to worry about another winter. Let's get you over there so you can spend some time with your family. How much more powerful of a close is that rather than just saying, it's, it, you know, it's the best offer we have. You know, let's sign it. We have to tie in that motivation when we're talking to a, a seller. So are you interviewing anyone else? This is all part of the pre-qualifying of appointments. Are you interviewing anyone else? 
it's a it's kind of a scary question because if they weren't inter- interviewing anyone else, you saying this, is it gonna spawn the idea of them interviewing someone else because you mentioned it? Probably not. But if they are interviewing someone else, I want to know about it because I want to prepare myself going out on that appointment. So are they interviewing anyone else? I built my business from the ground up, mainly with expireds and for sale by owners and working these, a lot of the times they were interviewing other people. And I wanted to know who they were interviewing. I wanted to know when they were interviewing them. That way I can position myself. So if they were interviewing people, let's just say, yes, we are. We're interviewing off, We're interviewing three people and we're interviewing one on Wednesday, another one on Thursday. And that that's what we're doing. And great. You know what? I think that's a great idea. That's what I'm saying to them because if they already have this on the table, it's a great idea. You know, you know what? I think it is important to interview multiple people. You want to make sure the agent you end up with is the right agent. This is a very important financial decision. And I'd love to interview for the job of selling your home. How does Friday sound? So they're interviewing someone Wednesday and Thursday. I'm coming in on Friday. If I, now that I know, if I didn't know that, it, there's all types of stuff that can happen that can work against me. But now that I know she's interviewing three people and I'm the third, or I position myself as a third. Now I can say to myself, you know what? I'm going to come in as the last person and everyone else has already been done. She should be ready to make a decision as the final person. Now there's debate on which is the best position to be in. I'm interested in hearing what you guys have to say. What's the best position to be in if there's three appointments going out, the first position, the second position, or the last position? I think there's benefits from all positions, just to kind of put it out there. But what do you think? Just uh, just throw it down in the comments section. What do you think? Last. Last. I like last too, because as I mentioned, they've already gone through everything and they should be ready to make a decision there. They don't have to like wait and compile information. They have everything and you can set the bar so high and you can kind of go off of what other people discussed. Hey, by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, I know I gave you a bunch of information. Is there anything that was discussed in your other meetings that we didn't hit on? Now you can kind of go off of some things. So if I'm last, I want to make sure that I have the opportunity to go out there because good listing agents will go out there as a first or second person and they'll try to close. They'll try to close and not let anyone else come through the door because they know if they leave that house, their chances of getting that listing diminishes instantly. So what they'll do and what I would do if I'm the first agent is I'll go out there and say, hey, look, you know, can you see me listing your property and us working together as a, as, as a seller and a listing agent? Yes, I could. Well, let's not waste anyone else's time. I know you have a couple other appointments lined up. Let's not waste their time. Let me go to work for you. I'll give them a call. I'll let them know that you already chose a, a, a real estate agent and I'll even do one thing better. I'll invite them to, uh, for any buyers they have, I'll be willing to share my commission with them and, and, and pay them for any buyers they have. How does that sound? Okay, sure, I'll do that. And I've done that before. I've made the call to other agents going out there as a first agent. So if you're going out there as a first agent, you can set the bar so high that they love you and you don't have to waste anyone else's time. Or if you're the first agent, another thing that I'd like to do is if you can't close and like, you know, I already promised them to come through and I, I have to do it. I have to see some other people. Great. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, can, can you do me a favor? Because I know there may be some things that you may discuss that we haven't thought of. Can we, can we just have a quick meeting after you meet with the last person, just, just for fairness and for me to come back to the table with anything we may have missed? Uh, can you promise me that, that you'll be able to uh, discuss for 15 minutes, a quick, short meeting? Now you have like the first and last meeting and, and they promised you that. So not a bad strategy to go out there as a first. And I've done it before. Um, the last I like, but, and here's what I would do. So if I book an appointment for the last person out there, what I would do is I would have them promise me that I actually get the appointment right? Because we don't want that number one person coming out trying to close and I not even get a chance to go out. So I would tell them, hey, uh, Mr. Seller, I know there's going to be some agents that go out and they're going to try to pressure you into signing an agreement or a contract and not allow me to come out. 
I want to at least have the opportunity to, to interview for the job. Can, can you promise me something? Can you promise that you'll at least allow me the opportunity to sit down with you before you make any decisions? Chris, yes, I will. Now, when someone goes out and they try to present a contract, bad word, if they try to present a contract to the seller and have them sign, they're going to remember that promise that they made to me and that's going to bother them. And if they do sign, they're going to have a lot harder time doing that because they promised me that they'll allow me to come out. So um, that's what I would do if you're going out first. And that's what I would do if you're going out last. Okay. So thank you guys for, let me see if you guys uh, dropped any comments in the comments section. Um, Geraldine says last. All right. I like it. Um, and anyone else want to comment? Feel free. But yeah, I like last. I like first too. I think you could do some damage in both uh, positions. So you have your positioning. Uh, you have your upfront close. Upfront close is important. The final piece of a pre-qualification when you're talking to someone, preparing for the appointment, and by the way, this is something you do after the appointment's already booked. So you booked an appointment. Let's just say it's Friday at one o'clock. You booked the appointment. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, uh, before I let you go, is it okay if I just run down a quick list of questions before I let you go to help me better prepare for the appointment? It shouldn't take much more than one or a couple minutes. Absolutely, go ahead. Guys, we have to control these conversations, right? When we're talking to someone, just control the conversation. Let them know what you're looking to do. You don't have to do, oh, how am I going to ask them a couple of these questions? Just tell them what you're looking to do. Is it okay if I ask you a couple of questions before I let you go to help me better prepare for the appointment? When someone hears these things, they're like, wow, like this guy, he has his systems down. He has his, he's not just winging this. He's done this before or she has done this before. So the upfront close is a powerful, powerful, to me, one of the most important pieces of the pre-qualification. So Mr. Sell, if I, when I come out, if I, if, I can, if I can show you that I can help you sell this house and, and get you over to Kentucky and get you the amount of money you're looking for, will you be ready to go ahead and get the process started when we meet? I love that question because it puts them in a position to really give you an idea of what the heck is gonna happen on this appointment. Do I have a chance at getting it? Do I have no chance at getting it? Do I have to wait until whatever? And if you've missed any of these questions, they'll tell you, right? So yes, I will be, prepa I will be prepared to get the process started when we meet. When someone says that, you might as well just put your hands up like Rocky and be like, yeah, I got a listing coming up, let's go, right? What else can they say? No, I'm not going to be ready. I have to think things through. I have to talk to my, uh, my brother who's a real estate agent, or I have to meet another agent. If you didn't ask that question, they're going to tell you what their process is going to be like, their decision-making process. We just want to have an idea what the decision-making process is, not to necessarily object to it right there over the phone, but to prepare ourselves when we go out looking to get a signature, we want to be prepared, right? So Chantel, what if they ask how many homes have you sold when you haven't sold any yet? So good question. And I can tell you that most people are not going to ask that if you are in control of the conversation. So if you're in control of the conversation, and by the way, being in control of something is asking questions. When people are asking you questions, now you're not in control of anything. Just think of like a, a courtroom setting. If you're in a courtroom setting, the person in control is the person asking the questions. If you're answering the questions, the power shifted. You have to get in the position of asking questions and controlling the conversation. If you control the conversation, the perception is you've done this before. You have a system. So it's very rare that someone will just pop out if I go through the whatever I just mentioned. Hey, is it, is it okay if I ask you a few questions before I let you go to help me prepare for the appointment? Where it in their mindset would be, well, how many houses have you sold, right? But if you're kind of stumbling away through your discussion on booking an appointment, there's going to be some question marks. There's going to be some, you know, if you're hesitating or you're stumbling, now all of a sudden someone's going to like sniff that out. 
So I think one of the biggest compliments that I've got was my first listing appointment. My very, my very first listing appointment, the best compliment that I received was, you were very well prepared for this. And that, they said that to me. And it was my first listing, pre and I didn't get the listing, by the way. But I left with my head up knowing that I prepared the best I could for that appointment. And I felt like I had that appointment a hundred times already because I role played. I my my what I was gonna say was already rehearsed. It was canned. It was in my I had the objection handlers already in my toolbox, ready to go. So the best thing to do is to be prepared. Now, with that said, if someone asks you what it how many uh properties you have sold, then you can't lie. You have to tell the truth. You know what? I, I haven't sold any properties. However, my company has sold X amount of properties over the last 12 months. I'm a part of a team that has sold X amount of properties over the last months. I'm in good, you're in good, you would, you will be in good hands if you hire me. And I actually have full-time dedication to those clients that I do take on. You know, would you rather deal with an agent that has an overwhelming amount of agents uh, or clients that scrambling around they don't even conduct their own open houses they don't show their own clients property or would you rather be someone who's going to be there in the trenches with you go so there's always ways you can kind of flip it in a positive way so if i'm on the other side of it of course i'm going to flip it a different way but you just have to be able to be prepared to answer that question and put a positive spin on it here's the reality you're not going to get every single listing you're not going to get every single client and that's just the way it is the statistics are the best agents only get 70% of the listings they go out on. The best agents. So Chantel, no disrespect, but you may not be the best agent. So you may not get 70%. Maybe that means you get 50%. Maybe that means you get 60%. Maybe that means you get 40%. So if it's the lack of experience you have being the reason you don't get a listing, then that's what it is. If it's you don't have enough hair, and that's the reason you're not getting a listing, then that's what it is. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. You're not this enough. You're not, there's always going to be ways you're not going to get a listing. So it's just, it is what it is. It's just part of that percentage of you not getting a listing. But with all those things being said, I would still have an articulate response somewhere in the ballpark of what I mentioned, focusing in on your dedication to the listings that you do have, the more time you have to dedicate to the listings that you have, because you don't have an overwhelming amount of clients. Okay. And I would still put the company's expertise behind you. So they do have some credibility with that as well. You know, my company, we sell over a thousand properties a year. You know, we have over 360 agents. I have a huge team of, you know, people I can lean on those type of things. You want to have some statistics and we'll talk about those in another slide. Arriving at the home. So here we are, we have the appointment. We pre-qualify. Now we're arriving at the home. I would encourage you guys not to park in the driveway um, if you can because a couple of things depend unless you're on a main road parking in a driveway sometimes can be fine other times people can look at it as a sign of disrespect who's this person think they are pulling up in my driveway taking my spot maybe you park what's that you know you don't know what the mindset of someone is right because it's like you know, some people don't even like people parking in front of their house. Not if you're coming up for an appointment, but you know, as neighbors parking in other people's neighbor's house, you're like, what are they parking in front of my house for? So you want to park in front of the house. Uh, you don't want to park in someone's driveway. You could park in someone's in front of someone's uh, garage stall. They could try to pull out if there's someone's leaving, maybe the kids leaving, who knows? So you don't want to have any interruption with the flow of their parking. Uh, so park on the street, get there about five minutes early. I wouldn't get there much earlier than that. If you do get earlier to the appointment, maybe pull down the street around the block, because we have to understand something. When you are coming to someone's house, more likely than not, they're getting ready for you to visit them. You're a real estate agent. They're, they're, they're trying to prepare their house for, for there to be shown in the, in the best light possible. So if you get there thinking you're doing a good thing a half hour early, they're probably going to be vacuuming, dusting, cleaning, and they're going to be like, oh my God, they're already here. You know, and they're going to look out the window and see you there a half hour early, even though you're not pulling up. They're just going to add a, a different level of stress to the whole situation. So get there five minutes early, sit in your car, do not go up to the door until your time. Maybe you have a 12 o'clock appointment, you get there 1155, 
Sometimes you'll see them wave you in. Hey, Chris, come on in. Okay. If not, you walk up to the door. Hey, this is Chris Martin. We had a appointment at 11 o'clock. It's 11 o'clock. I'm here. All right. So you're acknowledging that you're on time. And if they wave you in, you can just let them know. I just got here a few minutes early. And I was just in my car preparing for the appointment. It's very important to me. Um, and letting them know. And you should be preparing for the appointment in your car. You should be preparing for your appointment in your mind. You don't want to be having uh, negotiating another deal with another agent that you know the agent sucks to talk to. You already know your 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 mood's going to go down talking to this person or you know whatever. Leave that for after the appointment. You know, and 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 get your mind ready for this new piece of business. Don't go in there with any negative mindset, negative attitude. All right. So the walk through the home is it okay? We walk through the door. We acknowledge we're on time. Uh, is it okay if I walk through the home? Uh, and take a few minutes and look at the home from the buyer's perspective. So I, I, I like to throw that out there, of just looking at the home from a buyer's perspective. Uh, we talked about why they purchased in the prequal, but you can go over those things again with them. And locating an area to sit in the property. Um, so usually, let's just say there's a kitchen table, and that's a table where they normally occupy. It'd probably be a good place to sit at the kitchen table. I like using an area that it's more common to them rather than a formal dining room that they barely use. And you're going to sit in this space and it's just going to be a little more tense because it's not a commonly used space rather than sitting in an area that they're using on a daily basis. They're more comfortable. They're more going to be relaxed. So this is some psychology stuff that may help you in some subtle ways sitting at an area. Also sitting in an area and you kind of setting the stage of how people should sit. Okay, if there might be a chair they sit in all the time. Well, you know, I, I see this is your 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 seat. Uh, is it okay if I sit here and you sit there? And you know, maybe it's like set up the situation on how you want that to sit. Normally, you don't want people like this because then you're going to be like this, bouncing back. You're going to be your head's going. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you, and then I'm going to talk to you, and then I'm going to talk to you. How you're really shifting your focus in an ideal way? You're kind of like facing them both. Exactly. You know, and you really want to be able. This is where the art of selling really comes into play, guys, because this is what excites me. You know, some people get drawn into real estate because selling Sunset or million dollar listing or whatever. And yeah, that stuff's cool. But for me, I like the selling part of real estate. I like the part like this stuff right here is all strategy. How much time are you dedicating to person to person? If there's a two person meeting, you and two people, you have to be able to share your your attention with two people. You should be talking to this person and this person, making eye contact with both people and, and being able to focus attention. Maybe if you, I don't think it should be 50-50, you know, where you're focusing attention here and bouncing things off this person, this person. It should almost be a 60-40 split, 60 going to the person that you feel is going to be the decision maker, right? And, I, and that's going to be, you know, very uh, subtly, but you can make those splits and really hit harder with the person that you know is going to make the decision. All right. It doesn't mean you're abandoning anyone. It just means you're making your points a little bit more so with the person that you know is going to be making the decision, which a lot of the times it's probably going to be the wife. But, um, you know, to feel that out and you'll probably be able to uh, um, identify that. Oh, another thing before I forget, when you are going to an appointment, I would make sure that you um, talk to the other person before you go out. So let's just say, you know, a lot of the times I book my appointments on the phone, I may be in communication with the husband the whole time or the wife the whole time. But whoever I'm in touch with the whole time, I'm going out meeting with both of them. I don't want to go out there and meet with both of them. And the other person is like, oh, they, this person, they've already been talking. They almost feel like it's the other person's agent rather than both of their agent. I don't want that to be the case. So Connect with the other person. Hey, is it okay if I um, uh, if I reach out to your husband and just introduce myself, see if he has any questions before I come out to the appointment? Now you can reach out to the husband. Hey, I've been talking to your wife and I'm coming out on Friday. I'm excited to meet you guys. I just wanted to introduce myself to you. See if you had any questions before I come out and uh, and be here for, for any questions you have. Now you kind of have a little bit of a relationship with both of them to where when you go out, he feels equal, she feels equal versus you know one way or the other. One minute listing presentation. You guys ready for this? 
There's the one minute listing presentation. So you view the home, you sat down at the kitchen table. Here is a listing presentation in one minute. All right. So listing presentation is one minute, courtesy of your boy, Mike Ferry. Uh, if you guys haven't heard any Mike Ferry stuff, um, definitely check his stuff out because he's um, he's pretty good. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. Yep. So one minute listing presentation goes something like this. So thanks again for having me over. I'm excited getting your home on the market and getting it sold. Do you mind if I take a quick look at your home? We talked about that. I wrote down three real important questions for you. Do you absolutely need to sell your home? Yes, we do. Fantastic. Will you price your home in a way to, to keep it on the market for a long time? Or, do you, or are you looking to price it aggressively and sell? Okay, great. Do you want me to handle the sale for you? Great. All we need to do is simply sign the agreement so I can get, your, get you what you want and the time you want. Won't that be great? That's it. That's the listing presentation. There's really no need to go into all of the ins and outs of how you get a property sold and all this and all that if they are going to sign the agreement with you anyway. You don't want to talk your way out of a listing. So do you want me to handle this for you? If they say yes, then you should just be hands up like Rocky because you know you have the listing. Why are you going to go through a 15-minute presentation if you don't have to? So this is only for people that they know you, they want to hire you, and they will list at your price, by the way, okay? So it's not for all people. It's not going to happen a, a big chunk of the time, but you can kind of start this presentation and, and, and move forward that way. All right, so we did the walkthrough assessment. I usually carry around with me with the square footage, bedrooms, baths, and all that thing so I can make some notes. Company information, once I sit down with them, I have some stats of the company. We have over 360 agents. Uh, you know, we sold over 1,000 properties over the last however many months. You know, we are in Massachusetts and uh, New Hampshire and Maine and Rhode Island. And we, um, you know, any, any kind of one-liners that can just help represent the company and add credibility to the company you work for. However, I, I, I work with a great company. I wouldn't work for any other company. However, it's not only just the company, it's the individual that you hire because the individual Mr. Seller is going to be the one at the forefront. That's going to be the person that's going to be marketing your property, not the company. You know, uh, uh, it, it can be a misconception that people think the company does the selling. It's the individual. So as much as I, I love the company I work for, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. And here's, here's some of my personal stats. And go on with your own personal stats. You know, every time you sell a property, that's a story. Anytime you go through a negotiation, that's a story. Anytime something helps you in a transaction, you get a property sold, these are little stories that you can pull into your listing presentation. You know, there was a time that, Mr. Seller, you know, I, we, were, we were going back and forth. You know, the seller wanted to list at 725 and I wanted to list at 699. I can tell you that I ended up getting $800,000 for that property by listing at 699, drawing more interest, bidding up multiple offers. And by the way, we only had three offers. You know, you would have thought we had 10 because the people that were interested, I made sure that I did my job and got those people to a number that was much more than we could have thought of when we first put this property on the market. So, you know, that's to, to, to resonate with someone who may be thinking about listing their property higher than what you want to list it for. Now you have a story on a similar situation where it actually worked out. So you want to have these situations, you know, open houses, maybe you do powerful open houses and you draw interest and, you know, all that stuff. So have these little stories tucked away. Um, personal stats, what you do to get a property sold, I call it a plan of action, establish price, sign the agreement. That's it. That's your, that's your order of things that you need to do, right? You show up at the appointment. We talk about the things before the appointment, during the appointment. It's really just going through those, those uh, pieces of information. So there's all types of, um, you know, your, your presentation piece is going to be, you know, again, stuff about the company, stuff about you and pricing information, right? That's really it right? The marketing, the pricing, and you're going to handle the objections accordingly. But you're going to move through this stuff pretty quickly. I don't think a listing appointment should take more than 15 or 20 minutes as far as the content of it. 
Now you'll probably be there longer than that, but as far as the content, the, the, the meat and potatoes of it, it's only 15 or 20 minutes. It's not going to take you long to go through this stuff. All right. So hopefully that helped you guys. Uh, the one minute listing presentation could also be for someone you sense is a driver type of person. They just want to get it done. Absolutely. Justine just mentioned that the, the one minute listing presentation is, uh, could be for driver uh, personalities. Absolutely. If you send someone like for me, I just want to know how much you're charging. What are you going to list a property for? And let me, let, let, let's go. Like, you know, if you, if you feel like someone's in that state of mind, then yes, you, you don't want to have to like drag things through. They're going to be ready to kick you out of the house before you, you know, halfway through. So sense what the other person's personality is and deliver the message accordingly. So Justine, thank you for mentioning that. Hopefully this helped you guys out and continue to watch videos on this channel on handling objections, on all those things that are gonna go into your listing presentation, whether it's in person as a presentation or it's on the phone on getting that appointment in the first place. So watch other videos on this channel, subscribe, like, comment, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.